Hello, everybody. Um, welcome to teaching and studying the classics today, a faculty and student roundtable. Thank you to all of you joining us here in person and online. Um, I'm Dr. Marianne Dietrichborg. For those of you who don't know me, I'm a special collections librarian for rare books. Um, and I'm thrilled to be welcoming all of you and introducing today's event. Um, before I dive in, just a few logistics. Restrooms and water are past the elevators and to your left. Um, I'm going to introduce the speakers in pairs before each pair presents, and then we'll open up the conversation to Q&A at the end of all the presentations. Um, and at that point, or after Q&A, there will also be time for you to explore the materials in the front of the room if you are interested, which we hope you will be. Um, and these are all materials that will be discussed during today's presentation. Um, you'll be reminded again later, but if you do come up, please leave your belongings at your seat. Um, and there are all there will also be there are surveys um, on the back table um, and a link to a survey will be put in the chat for those of you joining online um, please take a minute before you leave to complete a survey your feedback is very valuable to us um, and so on to the main event the inspiration for this round table was multiple collaborations um, that i've had with classes students and faculty over the past few years um, I'm excited by these research and teaching projects, and so I want others to know more about them. Um, I've been doing these roundtables for the past few years, and I'm very grateful to, the, to all of those who agree to speak and share their expertise and help me and others to better understand the materials in our collection. These materials are collected and preserved to be used, and anyone can get in contact with me to request access or more information or to discuss ideas for future collaborations or projects. Please don't hesitate. So the presentations are going to proceed more or less chronologically. So we'll begin with Dr. Corey Crawford. Dr. Crawford is Associate Professor in the Department of Classics and Religious Studies. His research is broadly focused on the intersection of text, space, and material culture, as well as on questions of gender and authority in ancient West Asia or the Near East. He earned his PhD at Harvard University and has written on a variety of topics, including on sacred space, the visuality, gender, and the modern reception of the Bible. He was named University Professor in 2014 and held a year-long fellowship at the Biblical Archaeology Institute at the University of Tübingen, Germany. Dr. Crawford is an active archaeologist digging at the ancient Canaanite city of Hazor. Professor Crawford will be presenting with Haley Rennick. Haley is a classical civilizations graduate. She hopes to continue her study in classics and continue on to graduate school to study to be a Roman historian. Good. So, please, Dr. Crawford. Uh, download it. No, you're good here. Okay, great. Thank you so much, um, Dr. Intratore, uh, and and everybody who has put work into um, into this this uh, this roundtable. And I'm really happy um, to talk about my experience. Um, and uh, in, in engaging with these materials um, and with Dr. Intratour and the and the library because it is um, one of those things that makes the university a really special place that um, these collaborations can happen and just a plug for any administrator listening to keep supporting them. <laughs> um, so, um, so I'm just going to run through really briefly uh, my connection to the materials and then um, how students got involved, and um, and it starts with, um, if I can do full screen. This is not anyway. It's fine. This is an email. Take my word for it. From um, that I, I went back and found um, back in 2017. Um, Dr. Intratour emailed me and said, "Hey, I want to introduce myself, and we have some stuff that you might be interested in for your um, for your your courses." She'd gone through and looked looked at the courses I was teaching, and and uh, I was in the throes of tenure, and and uh, eventually got back to her, and um, and so we went and we we looked at at the 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 Bible um, that um, Dr. Bernstein is going to talk about today. Um, and kind of as, as I recall as an afterthought, she said, oh, we've got these other things that you might be interested in also, which are these um, these objects here. Um, a cuneiform tablet, uh, Egyptian scarab, probably Egyptian scarab, stamp seal, and a cylinder seal. Um, 
and I about fell out of my chair because, you know, I had been here uh, already for uh, eight years or something and never in a million years would have thought we had a cuneiform tablet. And I studied these objects in, in grad school, these kinds of objects. And so that led um, me to uh, ask a bunch of questions. Um, uh, and we and, and it opened the collaboration, I guess, um, um, on these these objects. And so I I wanted to know I wanted to publish them eventually, but also to analyze them and um, you know get them translated where where uh, possible and things like that, and also preserve them. Um, the library had already um, had uh, some initiatives underway. Um, the CT scan, micro CT scans, and and 3D printing. There's a great uh, video on it, um, and you see um, uh, both Miriam's in the, the picture there. Um, as the tablet is going into the micro CT scanner, um, which enabled the production of um, uh, 3D printed models of these objects, so that even the ones that are that are uh, sort of friable, fragile, could be uh, engaged with. Um, I helped coordinate a. In 2022, a visit to Dr. Catherine Fornash's lab in geological sciences, um, so we could run some scanning electron microscopy um, studies of these uh, objects, which yielded not only close-up images, but also uh, you know that tells us about how they were manufactured, but also the composition. We did some X-ray um, uh, scatter uh, analysis that showed us. Um, that maybe some of the documentation was not accurate um, that that came with the the, the objects themselves. So um, so the question of provenance became also really, really important. Where did these come from? Um, and uh, they were sold uh, to the university by this guy, Alfred Stites. So this is an example of a certificate that came along with, I believe this is OU's uh, version of this certificate. Sold by this guy, Alfred Stites, a real character who lived to be 94, died in 2016. Um, and he packaged and sold many of these collections to universities across the country, and not just universities, also libraries and presumably individuals, but those are harder to find. And um, um, so, of course, uh, Miriam was instrumental in in sort of digging up this information. Um, and she also found that uh, there was this guy, Arthur Askins, um, a professor, an emeritus professor, um, uh, who in 2007 had just retired from UC Berkeley. So he had been trying to uh, reassemble pages from a Spanish, a late medieval Spanish manuscript, which I say Portuguese because some people it was mismarked as some of the leaves were mismarked as Portuguese. And he had dug in to this group um, or this company that Alfred Stites had restarted called Folio Files. Um, and he had left, Arthur Askins had left two boxes of notes in the Bancroft uh, Special Collections Library at, at UC Berkeley. So, um, so he had done a lot of the, the the background work into um, who purchased these collections because he was trying to reassemble these pages. So um, I supported by my department and I think some HTC funds. Um, I went in September 2022 to the Bancroft Library. Such a rough trip to go out to California um, and enjoy the good weather and look at these boxes and photograph lots and lots of the, um, the pages. Um, that uh, of research that he had compiled and left there in the special collections. Um, so that gave us a lot of information about who had purchased similar lots of, of items. Um, I also met uh, some old friends in the in, in this uh, special collections visit. Uh, this is an email from Arthur Askins to Miriam Shaddis at Ohio University asking about our late medieval uh, manuscript leaf, which which we had, so we helped collaborate on that project, and it was fun to run into her. Um, he published, or he yeah, he circulated his, the results um, of his endeavor. This is just a word document, a late medieval, and I believe it was published in a journal as well. And then he also summarized Askins summarized what he had found out about Alfred Stites, um, this dealer, and he had actually met him. Um, gone out to like visit him and um, 
uh, you know, find out about him. Stites incidentally graduated from Denison um, up the road in 1944. So, so I came back from that trip in the middle of the semester, right? And I mentioned to my students where I'd been and how exciting it was. And three students um, approached me independently and said, I really want to be a part of this, uh, including two of the students. Well, this is Liliana, who was going to be here today, but she's ill. Uh, Maggie Benick and Haley Rennick, who's not pictured in this particular photo, um, who is going to speak to us in just a second. So we developed the objective in independent study to find and document the pages from the past sets starting from Askins's research, and then to build a survey instrument to send out to libraries to, to figure out what is the current condition, if known, um, of the objects that other libraries purchased, like the ones that we have. Hopefully the idea, my idea was to build and publish a corpus of these items, try to figure out maybe what dealer, okay, what dealer um, had been, um, uh, used in the acquisition of these objects. So we we uh, created, we shared, we collaborated with a Google Sheet uh, and sort of broke up um, uh, the group, uh, broke up the, the institutions uh, by the number of people that we had, um, did some internet research, and then um, we looked at the objects. Here's the three students and Dr. Intratore uh, looking, looking at the objects and the documentation. We also were trained in REDCap, which is a um, survey instrument that uh, OU is contracted with. Um, and uh, we developed a, um, a, a survey that um, Haley, this is Haley here, she's gonna speak to us in just one second, um, that Haley, she picked up the software really fast and uh, was sort of the architect of, we all collaborated on the language and the, and the flow um, and um, as of this semester, we have this, uh, we have a survey that we're about to start to send out to uh, libraries and other institutions to try to track down some of these items, hopefully to get them also published and, um, and preserved. So um, once again, a plug for collaboration. Here are some of the credits of people that have been involved that we've interacted with um, directly um, and a, a big thank you to those and to the to the students. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Haley. Um, and I think she's here. Yes, to uh, talk about her experience. Oh, yeah, OK. Um, did where'd she go? Uh oh. Oh, there there we are. OK, um, we can see you, Haley. Perfect. Okay. All right. As Professor Crawford stated, um, my job primarily was doing the technical skills of making the survey. Everyone, you know, participated in uh, building the questions up, but my job was to make the survey look nice and uh, function properly. Um, this project, as Professor Crawford mentioned, deals a lot with some of the uh, ethics and issues of like. Uh, you know, the provenance of these objects. There are beautiful artifacts that we've had for decades that almost nobody knows we have them, which is really unfortunate because they are amazing. Um, we dealt with a lot of questions of how to best, you know, present these objects, both academically with these other universities and libraries and possibly with publishing. Um, and we all have, you know, come to really care for these objects and we hope that this project will help bring them more into the light and that by continuing this work, we'll be able to kind of put all these uh, pages and tablets back together. Uh, well, not physically, but digitally that um, anyone who's doing research on, say, the cuneiform tablets or the Spanish uh, manuscripts can be able to have access them. Um, I mean, there's a lot of issues that have been involved that plague all of the classics uh, studies of provenance and the ethics of trading artifacts, especially back before um, there was more strict laws. So anything back in the 60s, like we have found uh, in this particular project. Um, 
we hope that, you know, by doing this study that it can help address some of these issues, maybe not, not be fully, of course, but we can start looking at the issues that uh, arise in this kind of project of where they came from, the issues that come from the study of them. Um, and at the very least, we hope that by doing this project, that these beautiful artifacts will be better preserved, that we can get the funding and the people to help make sure that um, not only our tablets and uh, manuscripts and scarab seals get uh, you know, taken care of and preserved as is our duty by having these artifacts, um, but the other ones that are spread out throughout the country. Um, so I hope that you know by the next steps we get to find where more of these are. Um, I'd be, I'm excited to see you know if they have more images and 3D scans of them. They're fascinating objects, and I'm looking forward to the next steps. I hope that you know we get a lot of good replies from the other universities and libraries. Thank you. Awesome, Haley. <laughs> okay. um, thank you so much, Dr. Crawford and Haley. Um, so next we have Neil Bernstein, a professor in the Department of Classics and Religious Studies, where he has taught since 2004. He has been a distinguished scholar in residence at Western University, London, Ontario, a National Humanities Center Fellow in Research Triangle Park, North Carolina, and a Fulbright lecturer at National Taiwan University in Taipei. Um, his books include Silius Italicus Punica, I should try to pronounce these, Rome's War with Hannibal, um, and most recently, a translation of Claudian's Complete Works for Rutledge. Um, Professor Bernstein was going to be presenting with Liliana Mays, but unfortunately, she is not going to be able to make it today. Um, but she is a fourth year in English and Classical Civilizations. After graduation, she hopes to take two years to complete an art history master's before going on to law school to concentrate in cultural heritage, art, and museum law. She is president of the OU Classics Club and vice president of the Comparative Religions Club and Edda Sigma Phi Honors Society. Dr. Bernstein. Well, I need to thank Miriam twice. First, for the exceptional introduction. Secondly, for making what I'm going to talk about today possible. Okay, sorry. Uh, yeah. Secondly, for making what I'm going to talk about today possible, um, she encouraged Kyle and me to put our learning, our scattered learning about individual manuscripts and the manuscripts of the collection together in a package that's accessible to others. Without her inspiration and guidance, we would not have been able to do this. And until just take a little bit to talk about what the manuscripts are, and then I want to talk about how this came about. Okay, so what the manuscripts are. The Ohio University Special Collections is the grateful recipient of another person's generosity. Um, um, Dr. Farfel um, was a physician who, as, an, as a hobbyist, collected a great number of manuscript leaves, individual leaves, such as this one. And he left, we're grateful that he left extensive notes on how he acquired them, what he thought they were, which enable us to begin cataloging them and presenting them on the website. So for many, many, many years, Miriam gave generously of her time to let me bring students in to the Special Collections Library and actually see these things in person. And this really helped me teach Latin students the context of the language that they were learning. How do we come to have the words on the page in front of them that they were reading in their Latin books? And then how did people use them? Okay, I'm not sure how big I can get on the screen. Yeah, <laughs> I can get big enough that you can see a little hand pointing to a, uh, that's one really kind of Pinocchio thing, you know, <laughs> Pinocchio nose like finger. And then you see another person has gone and script, you know, we have these neatly lined margins so someone can scribble in, right? 
you get a whole nother view of these manuscripts when you see actual users interacting with them, leaving their marks on them. Also, I don't know about you, but after many years of studying, I still find this Gothic script hard to read, right? It's not what we're used to. So, um, as I say, for many years, Miriam gave very generously of her time, allowing me to bring classes in and present and discuss the manuscripts with, with um, the class. Um, then came the pandemic. And while it was unfortunate in many, many other respects, it was fortunate that just the previous semester, I'd been up in Canada as Kyle's guest. So there we were in spring of 2020, having just had a semester together in the fall of 2019, when I was a visitor up there. And they were both you know, there in the spring of 2020, dreading the fall of 2020, when we would have to start teaching without a classroom, right? And he is even more into manuscript study than I am. I do it mainly as a teaching, as a teaching tool to help students better appreciate the Latin language that they're learning the context in which these Latin words were produced and consumed. So we put our heads together and said the same kind of things we've been doing in that room, could we do them in a series of online tutorials? And Miriam said, yes, you can. <laughs> and as I say, it gave us the structure and the format for what became ultimately five tutorials. One presented by Miriam on the prize item of the Latin manuscript collection, a Bible. This is, this is the one millionth volume, right? Presented to a high university to celebrate the acquisition of the one millionth volume. Um, I am not going to touch it. <laughs> <laughs> um, it is a very rare and precious object. It is the culmination of thousands of human uh, hours of work, both producing the animal skin um, substrate that it's written on, copying the Bible out by hand, and then doing what we call illumination. Um, in other words, not just why write a letter P when your letter P could take up the entire left margin, really calling attention to the beauty and, and, and craftsmanship that has gone into this object. The sort of thing you can kind of get on the screen, but there's not really the same, you know, it's not really the same as turning it page by page and seeing how much human labor went into this beautiful display object. Okay, so the first tutorial gives some of those excellences. Uh, then Kyle and I wrote the succeeding four. We start with things that we hope are familiar. This is a printed leaf in the Farfel collection. It is not handwritten. It was printed on an early, on an early printing press. And so it ought to be familiar. The series of four tutorials works from most familiar to least familiar. So even though this is quote familiar, I don't think a lot of you have seen a text laid out in this in most of the books that you read, right? This is a very particular 15th century way of pre presenting text and reading it. So by working from most familiar to less familiar, in other words, here's another printed book, but someone's gone and written a pointer in it, right? And we see that, remember the manuscript I showed you at the beginning with all the pointing fingers? We see that habits of thought, habits of using books that began when manuscripts were copied by hand, still carry over into the age of print. Okay. Finally, in the second half of the tutorial series, well, we get to the harder stuff. Again, working from most familiar to least familiar. Um, we start with a handwritten text, but one that looks very familiar to us if we're based on print, uh, current printed type. Think of your Times New Roman 
that you sh change your computer setting, you change your word processor setting to when you need a particular font. Well, this is where it comes from, from the humanist hands of the 15th century. So our collection is not large, but it, thanks in part to Dr. Farple's collecting and other kinds of acquisitions like the pages from the past, we are able to trace the history of first copying text by hand and then the transition into print. Uh, I hadn't planned to talk about this because I did not know about Sight, Alfred Sites until today, but he had his com he had his counterpart in this Latin manuscript collection. Uh, sorry, how do I get out of this? Oh, there we go. So the counterpart to Alfred Seitz, who presented primarily, mainly 3D objects, right? No? They yeah, just primarily. Go, primarily. Pages, pages. But he added okay. objects. Yeah. Okay. But he, to which he added objects. Okay. Uh, Otto F. Edge, who taught at uh, taught at an art institute in Cleveland, did very similar things with pages from Latin manuscripts, and made no secret about what he was doing. His job was to break apart books and present individual leads to universities and individuals who wanted to acquire a selection. So we talk about EJA as well and the practice of book breaking. And finally, well, we have to face it eventually, we get to the most unfamiliar and most difficult text to read, the oldest manuscripts. Um, so yeah, not the easiest to read. Um, oops. That's the thing I can't advance in these. But we get to ones where there are different layouts than we're used to, different abbreviations that we're used to, and different scripts. So by the time you are all done, you have a sense of what the Latin manuscript collection looks like, even if you were not able to get in. So this was a pandemic project. So how do we use it now? Well, here is where I'd hoped um, to hand over to Lily. Let me pretend to be her for a second. <laughs> In other words, now that we have the benefit of these tutorials to work with, before we send, before we as a class go to the manuscript room and look at these objects, instead of being exposed to them and having to learn all these ways of looking at them on the spot and immediately, we do the tutorials in advance and thus have a higher level interaction with the manuscripts when we get there. Next. Another person I have to thank is Dr. Charles Buchanan of the Interdisciplinary Arts Program, who generously gave of his time and energy consulting on particularly the illuminations to be found in these manuscripts as a fur, you know, because we now are coming in with a little more experience about what to see in a Latin manuscript, he's, he's um, gladly contributed his time each year to talk about illuminations, both in our collection and famous ones, such as a manuscript of the poet Virgil held in the Vatican Library. So that's what um, we're up to, to, as I say, supplement the learning of Latin, to say, how is this stuff being used? How, when you know the language, what can you begin to understand about how the words that you are reading come to you? How were they preserved and how were they used by the people who preserved them? Thanks very much for your time. Thank you, Professor Bernstein. Um, okay, and now we have um, Professor Fred Gregula, Gregula, sorry, uh, the Charles J. King Professor of Humanities and Professor of Classics. He is the author of two books and several scholarly articles and book chapters and specializes in the history of ancient Rome. As director of the King Institute, he works to support the teaching of the humanities at Ohio University and across the state, working to support the high school teachers with programming in the humanities. Dr. Dravula will present with Emma Campbell, a sophomore majoring in classical civilization. After graduation, she hopes to attend graduate school to continue her studies in classical history. Um, maybe. 
Hi, everyone. Um, this past spring, I had the privilege of being an intern in the Mon Center with um, Dr. Miriam Intertor and studying the classics collection that they hold. So I completed the internship with Miriam and I began the semester with 81 books um, in their classics collection that had not been previously researched and I researched them and put eight on display in a digital exhibit. I wrote a weekly reflection on what I found, what I learned, what I thought about it and how I was going to proceed with my project. And I finished it with a blog post that went into more depth with what I found, my research process, which parts I enjoyed the most, and what I learned from the experience as a whole. This is my process. I went through each individual book and looked at each individual page and documented everything that I found on a spreadsheet from every little note that any owner had um, marked in the margins to flowers that they left pressed or anything um, similar. I then researched each signature that I found and um, documented that on a Word document as well as on the spreadsheet. I went over my research and narrowed down which books I was going to exhibit and then I went back and tried to find any extra information on the owner, where they were from, where the book was printed, who printed it, etc. And I constructed my exhibit based on the location of the owner and the year of publication. And I got to write a blog to go into more depth about this process. Um, and I just wanted to go through and highlight a few books that I found the most interesting or I thought had the most hold in what we're talking about today. So this is the first one. It's um, this book is from Chatsworth, England. It's an anthology of poems, uh, the poems of Horace by the um, author of this book. Um, there are no names written in this book, but it's from 1594. So we can see how far back the um, study of classics has gone. This is the second book. It's um, a it's from Hamilton County, Ohio, and it's a compendium of Greek grammar. The previous owners of this book that I found were Joshua Wilson and Henry Bond. Not much could be found about either of them, but they left some fun messages in the pages of the book for us to find, as you can see um, on this page and a few other pages um, and one of the books up here. They scribbled back and forth to each other, arguing over whose book it was and who it belonged to and scribbling out each other's names, <laughs> as well as a few funny drawings. This is um, a book from Boston, Massachusetts, published in 1809. It's a book on the truth of the Christian religion. Um, and the owner of this book is archaeologist Oric Bates. He was a well-known archaeologist for the Peabody Museum of Harvard, and he is known for his work in Egypt and Sudan under George Reisner, who is another renowned archaeologist. And in the picture you can see this is the book plate that he had um, pasted in the beginning of the book. This is a book from Athens, Ohio. It's another compendium of Greek grammar. And the previous owner of this book is um, someone named DJ Patterson. We don't know much about him except that he lived in Athens and passed away here and is buried somewhere in Athens. Um, this book is um, from Ohio University, actually, and it's a collection of the complete works of Gaius Salustius Crispus. And he was a Roman historian and politician. There are no specific previous owners but um, there's a book plate in the front that places it in the original Ohio University and Athens County Library, which is a Carnegie Library of Ohio University, which is right next door and it is now Scripps Hall. Um, these are just my thoughts about my project. Um, I was really excited to research these books. I felt a really strong connection to all of the people that I researched, knowing that we all pursued the same knowledge in different centuries and thousands of years apart. Um, the thing that I still use and think about every day is that People have and always will be people. Um, so often people think of ancient people as stuffy and uptight and serious all the time. But as we can see, especially in the Joshua Wilson and Henry Bond book, people are always going to be people. And it just really helped me form a connection to them and feel really um, excited to continue my studies, knowing that so many people who were so similar to me um, studied these all throughout history and will continue to study them throughout history. All this was a really lightning project for me. I learned a lot, not just about these people and myself, but thanks to Dr. Miriam Intertor, I learned a lot about how to work with special collections and rare books and how to handle the items in those collections and what it means to be an archivist and how much work actually goes into that field. Um, just pull up my notes. 
I'm afraid I feel a bit like a poser uh, up here. I'm Fred Gugula. Uh, I did very little of the work here, virtually none. This is all Emma's work. Uh, Emma and Dr. Intrator worked on this together. I was fortunate to spend some time working with Emma on it, on some of the translations, and we talked about it, but it was all her work, so I feel a little bit wrong <laughs> being up here. Uh, I certainly I don't mean to be presenting her work, but rather to comment on how wonderful an experience it is and how uh, her projects like hers show the connections of our academic studies to the real world. Uh, in the College of Arts and Sciences, especially in our department in classics, we are focused on preparing our students, uh, their minds to interpret, to understand, to read critically, to argue. But people often ask, well, where's the connection to the real life? Where's the connection to the job? How do you get outside of the classroom? And this kind of experience that Emma did, I find is an excellent example of just that. One of the phenomenal things is that you know books, and I imagine if you are here on a Monday afternoon, you are a fellow bibliophile, and you just love books for themselves, and recognize that books are living entities that go through history just the way that we do. And I think this is one of the things that Emma's work caught exceptionally well, is that books are not just uh, you know, uh, objects without a character. They take on the character of whoever possesses them whoever interacts with them. The scribblings of the two fellows uh, in the book is absolutely hilarious as you go through page by page. And you can see a, you know, a real relationship, a lived life in there as it goes through. And so I think the, the study of these, uh, the books that she brought up, finding out, you know, we spent time Googling who were these people, trying to understand you know, who they were, how the books got here, especially in the earliest days of Ohio University. Why were these books chosen? Uh, um, uh, was a fascinating aspect of it. And so one is the human life, the human connection, the human interaction with books, all right, uh, as they go through. Two, another aspect that I thought her project was uniquely good at was really shining a light on the early study of academic fields at Ohio University, uh, especially uh, uh, people li uh, living today, especially some of our students who have spent their whole lives in the information age. It may seem odd to pause and think, I wonder if the library has a copy of Horace or of Sallust. And one of the things that we talked about when looking through the, the books that were available is understanding the severe limitations on finding books. And the fact that almost all of the books in the uh, departments, uh, classic department's original library were all secondhand, thirdhand, fourthhand, or more. That you couldn't just you know, go on Amazon and get a copy of Sallust. You had to find one. People had to, the collection had to be built from other people. And tracing the history of these books is a lesson in and of itself of the role that books play in human history, human education, and in the education of the institution. I get the third and last point that I'd like to make on this, and you know, again, I want to keep the focus on the work that Emma did, but is the interaction, as I said, with academic learning and the real world practice that uh, she was able to get through the Mann Center. And for this, I am uh, tremendously grateful to Dr. Intrator, to Alden Library, and to the Mann Center in particular, because it is this kind of specific, tangible uh, 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 um, uh, uh, work that they get to do with real objects that is a whole new aspect to their education. This is something, you know, in the Department of Classics and Religious Studies, we focus on reading texts and thinking about texts and understanding the texts and the author's intentions and the big ideas that they contain and how these ideas come through history. But the Mann Center working on projects like this brings an entirely different kind of focus. And a lot of our students are interested in just this, not just studying the past, but touching it and seeing that Sallust is not just a historian who lived 2000 years ago. He lives in books that have actually been going through hands and people have been reacting to for centuries and that there's a real fascinating pool of work to be done here. So I am immensely grateful to Dr. Intrator, to the Mann Center and to the library. And I am grateful just to get to comment on this wonderful project that Emma did. So I'm gonna leave it at that, thank you. <laughs>
time for questions um, from anyone in the room or anyone online. If there's anything in chat, um, do we have any questions? Start. Yes. Actually, sorry. Do you all want to come sit in the front? Maybe we can turn the lights on, and I'll get Haley back up. Sorry about that. Haley, yeah. Okay. Um, oops. Okay, go ahead, please. Well, it started out with just Googling the name to see what would come up. And I spent probably a few hours researching every one of these names because so much came up with a lot of the names I went through, um, like death records, funerary records, like um, cemetery records, stuff like that, school records, just anything I could find with these names on them and kind of compare to see which ones were um, the person I was actually researching and which ones were just repeats of the name. Although, if I can add to that, one of the interesting things that I think her work touched upon is why these editions of the books. So that sometimes uh, Emma would say, you know, what exactly is this edition? You know, and I, I did not know. <laughs> and so we would, uh, she would Google some of these looking. I mean, these are the deliberate choices that the people who are building Ohio <coughs> University's library. It's fascinating. Why did they want this author? Why did they want, is it all they could find? Maybe, or was there something particular? So we looked at, for instance, on the truth of Christian religion. Mm -hmm. We looked at that for a while, uh, um, trying to figure out what this book was, you know, what collection was it a part of? So it's interesting watching the choices that the early faculty and librarians at the university made. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm curious about the, uh, the, uh, the cuneiform tablet. Uh, were we given information on what what particular language it, it's in, what it's a text of, its date, and uh, if so, can we verify it? Uh, anything? Um, so that this is part of this was part of my question. Also, I myself studied Akkadian in grad school, but I, I don't work in actively in translating tablets. And so, um, so we're working on getting something to translate it. Uh, the, but the information, I'm glad you asked this question because the information that came with these, we have an example here um, of one of the boxes that was created or I'm not exactly sure what the relationship is with this particular box, but, but some of the documentation that came with it was pretty boilerplate. And so, um, so it's, it said Babylonian clay tablet um, um, with you know some generic sort of date reference. Um, it looks to me like um, like it's probably an Akkadian tablet. It's written in Akkadian. Could well be Babylonian, but if we if we did some um, we could do some testing to see testing of the clay itself to see where the affinities of the chemical composition of the clay lie geographically. So that's something we could do that costs some money. Um, but we we are suspicious of the documentation that it came with uh, because, for example, the cylinder seal says that it was um, a Babylonian cylinder seal circa 1700 BC excavated at Amlash which was a site that I had never heard of. Um, and it's almost certainly not the place that it came from. It's not, it says it, uh, one of the documents said it was stone. It's not stone. Um, probably it's faience or a uh, sintered quartz, which the scanning uh, microscope help us, helped us to lock out. And it probably is about, dates to about a thousand years later than the documentation says. Um, so that's we're trying to answer that, but partly this is why we, we looked into the provenance and the broader corpus um, because the we, we hope that that can give us more information about maybe if a dealer purchased a lot that came from a certain place that would help us narrow down the place. As of now, we don't like the, the information is not secure as to where specifically these things came from. But we can we can have it translated, um, and we're working on that. We haven't done it yet. Other questions? Yeah. 
Are there any questions in the chat? Wait, there might be. No. Okay. Any, any other questions in the room? Gentlemen, um, go ahead. First of all, thanks for the amazing news. I didn't know that. I know it's a small collection of artifacts, but uh, I try to read like uh, I again like it's a small collection and everything, but like I'm interested to know about the ethical tracing of. of the movement of this small collection from its original countries. And I know that like, it's known that we bought it from a dealer. What happened before the dealer? Do you have information about what happened before the dealer? And if we write this and did this effort, uh, I'm thinking about it. I don't know if it exists or not exist. It will be happy to that the university is abide by even with this small time collection with a bigger movement related to the ethical handling of artifacts. Like nothing like we will <laughs> I don't know about like in general how we handle the ethical approach of artifacts from other civilizations and other countries in our university. Yeah thank you. I'll, I'll give my piece of the answer, and then maybe I'll let uh, Dr. Andrew to respond. But this is exactly one of the questions that we were asking. And one of the questions that the students, uh, Haley mentioned it, and the students um, uh, were wrestling with. We decided that the first thing we have to do is to figure out exactly where it came from. We can't even talk about repatriation until we know the patria that it, that it needs to go back to, right? Um, and that's also way above my pay grade. But um, coincidentally, at the same time that we were running this uh, independent study, um, the Freakonomics podcast came out with a three-part series on this exact question. So we could you know, listen to it and engage um, those ideas. Um, I personally would be in favor of repatriation, and that's just me speaking for me. Um, but I also am pessimistic that we'll be able to, to, to locate exactly uh, which modern country these objects came out of because it's very, very difficult um, to know. We, we don't have any information about where Alfred Stites purchased these objects. Um, we're still looking, but, uh, but it's very, very difficult. Um, and so, uh, but, so that's part of the question that we're, that we're trying to answer. And I can tell you that the students um, themselves that I need to let Haley speak. Sorry, I ask these very questions. Haley, go ahead. Ah, uh, yes. Similar to what Professor Crawford says, um, I'm all in favor for repatriation. Uh, what it's one of the things we discussed and wrestled with in this project is how would we go about that if that's an option, um, since the provenance of these objects is questionable at best um you know we often sat and discussed you know all four of us of like should we you know we're wrestled with the question of should we even have these artifacts at all um it's i remember professor crawford compared it to having uh the one ring from lord of the rings you kind of want to keep it but you know you shouldn't um <laughs> so, it's very similar in that way we want to be able to you know put it back where it belongs. Um, but again, with it being so long ago that we acquired them and the lack of records of where they were from, uh, it's really hard to be able to give these pieces back to people who should have them. Um, a lot of our projects you know, was kind of accepting that and um, moving on to try to find any information we could on them so that if the option arose, we could repatriate them. Um, but a lot of it was well, if we can't figure that out, you know, what do we do? And I feel that, you know, um, it, 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 we should, probably shouldn't have them, but we do. So it's our duty to make sure that um, they are preserved and kept in the best you know, state possible and protected until hopefully one day we will be able to find out that answer and give them back. In the meantime, to like disseminate them through, through you know, public access on 
websites and these scans allow people to touch them and you know if, um, and I will, I will also add that this came like this came up for me in a like a more a personal way because uh, I was I was about to start work on publishing the cylinder seal but there's this debate in my field about whether that is even an ethical thing to do right because it encourages the uh, illegal excavation and the theft of cultural heritage and things like that. Although, you know, so there's this tension built in, even even to something that is well intentioned, like 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 publishing and helping us helping the public understand more. I think I, I think I have pretty well nailed down where um, when this was produced. Now is it not where but, and and why and the story that goes along with it, but um, but. You know, in doing so, am I crossing an ethical line? Um, so we 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 discuss that at, at some greater length too. Mr. Bernstein, did you want to add something? I just wanted to talk very briefly about the related set of issues with an individual leaf from a, what was once an individual book. Somebody broke this book up. Did so because it was perfectly legal at the time, but was it ethical? Secondly. You look at the library catalog for where these leaves and manuscripts come from. And they'll give names like Italy and France, neither of which existed at the time these objects were created. Italy was not a unified country until 1870, and parts of France did not become what we call France today until a similar time. Therefore, who had the right to sell this cultural patrimony? Furthermore, these manuscripts were held in the libraries and monasteries of cities that were routinely sacked by invading armies and captured as plunder their prized objects that conquerors value. So just to say, well, because these are countries that can demand their cultural patrimony, just because we, you know, we have a point of contact and a dealer doesn't mean they came to be in our hands by ethical means either. Yeah, I just was going to really briefly add that that again is part of the reason for the survey is that if there's a larger body of artifacts that are related, it might make it easier to figure out more of the history of provenance. Um, but also, just to give an example, Professor Bernstein mentioned the Farfel collection and how Dr. Farfel very carefully documented his purchases, um, where he got them, from whom, and when. Um, and digitizing these materials is part of all this because we um, digitized the Farfel collection um, and there is a university in, I think it was Switzerland, um, who found one of our leaves online and they had documentation as to its being removed um, from a book that had been part of a monastery that was now part of the university's library. And they knew the dealer that had broken the manuscript and dispersed it. And because of Dr. Farkle's notes, we knew that he had purchased it from that dealer. Um, and so we had all the information and we did indeed return that leaf to the university. So. Um, when we have the information, and that's another huge benefit of having these materials online, is people can find them, um, and we can learn so much more about them. So, is there one more question? Maybe online. One more question. We don't have any interest. Okay. Um, anything? Final thoughts or comments? Uh, you know, just to wrap up that last conversation, I'd like to say again, this is. One of the reasons why the opportunities that the students get in the Mann Center is so invaluable. Liliana Mays who couldn't be here with us today, but I know you mentioned she's going to law school specifically to look at repatriation law, an interest that she developed working on these projects uh, uh, and working with these artifacts and is now interested in pursuing a career in that very question. And it's an opportunity she got with this material. So. Yeah, thank you. Hey, Miriam, are we allowed to come up and Yes, just hold on. Um, thank you. Thank you all. One more round of applause. Um, so this does end our formal program. Um, thank you all for coming. Thanks to those of you online for coming. Um, you are very welcome. We'll turn the lights on and you can come and view the items. I will ask 